Greetings, respected viewers. I'm George from Ireland, and um, I'm opposite uh, number 21 Whitehall Court, London. So uh, this was where Sir Mansfield Cumming Smith lived from 1911 until his death in 1921, and indeed he worked here. So um, Sir Mansfield Cumming Smith is best known as having been uh, the, uh, the head of MI5. That's the United Kingdom's um, internal uh, intelligence uh, service. So uh, Mansfield Cumming, he was um, born in uh, Nottinghamshire in 1859 as Mansfield Cumming. So that's as far from, from sorry, as Mansfield Smith. Um, that's as far from the sea as you can get. And indeed his Christian name Mansfield is a name of a town in Nottinghamshire. His father was uh, an army officer, but he didn't, didn't rise to a high rank. So Mansfield decided he'd join the Royal Navy. He went off to train uh, for that at a Royal Naval College from the age of 12. Now, he later married a wealthy Scotswoman, uh, which is why he then got the name, uh, he took the name Cumming as part of his surname. So his surname became Cumming Smith. Often people just know him as Sir Mansfield Cumming rather than Sir Mansfield Cumming Smith. Um, anyway, so uh, he was, uh, he was served at sea for a while, but then an illness made him unable to serve uh, at sea very much more. Uh, he later had to have a leg amputated, and uh, one of his tricks was, because um, he had a, wood, had a wooden leg, was if people didn't know him very well, he would um, show his uh, ire by taking a penknife and stabbing it into his leg, and the people would almost faint, thinking he's stabbing his leg, but why isn't he bleeding? Of course, they didn't realize it was a wooden leg. So he liked to play these sort of tricks on people. Um, anyway, so then he became part of the part of naval intelligence, and finally they set up uh, MI5 in 1909. But uh, that's about catching um, foreign spies in the United Kingdom, whereas MI6 is going about going abroad and catching spies abroad. They didn't call it the MI5 and MI6 at first. Uh, so why is it MI? What does that stand for? It's military intelligence. It's not just military. It's political. It's economic. It's everything. Um, and what, the obvious question is, what happened to MI1, 2, 3, and 4? Well, that's because um, uh, in the First World War, there was MI up to number 10 or something. And I can't remember the different areas of responsibility, but one of them is for spying on Germany, another one Austria-Hungary, another one in Bulgaria, another one in the Ottoman Empire, another one's only naval, another one's about the Air Force, and on and on, another one's about neutral countries. But after the First World War, they rationalized it down and just MI5 and MI6. So uh, Mansfield coming, he didn't have a huge budget and he didn't have a great many uh, uh, secret agents on his books. And oh, they were worried about a war against Germany. And there was um, sort of spy mania in the yellow press. People thought there might be a sudden invasion. Novels were written about it, such as when William came, as in Kaiser Wilhelm II, the Emperor of Germany, or, um, sorry, German Emperor, to give him his correct title. Um, or uh, the invasion of 1910 and things like that. The Riddle of the Sands by Erskine Childers. And Erskine Childers, a former British Army officer, ironically then joined the IRA and later was executed by the Irish government for being too anti-English, despite him being about as English as he was Irish. Um, anyway, so um, Sir Mansfield Cumming, he directed operations here and they had a fairly good idea about the German intelligence network in the United Kingdom, which had a small budget. And German intelligence was only run by the German Navy, not the German Army, which is a bit of a mistake. And the thing is, they, weren't, they didn't serve for a career. They would come from the, from the German Navy, serve two years, and then go back to the mainstream Navy. Whereas these guys in MI5, they had been in the Army, or the Navy usually, there was no RAF in those days, and um, or sometimes even the police, occasionally from civilian life. And then they would sign up and have a career and spend decades and obviously grow expert at it. Now, I know there are pros and cons because, of course, they might become too institutionalized. There's too much groupthink. They lose their expertise in other fields. Um, that was that. So um, previously, the Metropolitan Police had tried to keep an eye on would-be terrorists or foreign spies and so on. But uh, when, when uh, the First World War broke out, they were able to ro roll up the German intelligence network quite quickly. Um, and there were stories that there were hundreds of German agents and they were all in the sewers and they were going to suddenly emerge at some time. And there were all sorts of ridiculous scare stories going al along, which a lot of weak-minded people believed. You get the same thing today, conspiracy theorists. It's very exciting to believe that. And people feel very gallant and clever to believe all this um, twaddle. Um, so uh, obviously Germany more than held its own in the First World War. Uh, and we talk about German efficiency, certainly in terms of industry it was. Man for man, it outproduced any other country in the world, including the United States. The US obviously just had more people and more natural resources. They were more efficient at killing people. Niall Ferguson, the historian, in his book, The Pity of War, has calculated how many dollars the Germans had to spend to kill every, every enemy soldier, and it was a lower amount. Um, 
but uh, one place where the Allies won, won the hands down, particularly the British, was espionage. So um, they uh, arrested most of the German agents pretty quickly, and um, the, the Germans were going to be from neutral countries, like particularly Dutchmen. Two Dutch guys came here in 1915 posing as cigar salesmen. It wasn't a very convincing cover. And, and, and had a bit of wallet litter to support their legend, as in their full story that they were cigar salesmen, um, but they didn't actually endeavor to purchase or sell any cigars. And they were arrested, and they'd been sending letters to a company in the Netherlands, and British intelligence was well aware this, this company was a front. It was a dummy company just used by British intelligence as an excuse for them to send letters back and forth. Um, so these guys were convicted of espionage and executed by firing squad. So um, about 20 German spies were caught that way. Um, the UK caught wind of the Easter Rising plot. Um, you know, Sir Roger Casement was arrested. However, it wasn't completely successful. The UK didn't think it was going to go ahead in the end because it had been cancelled. Um, and that was that. So they were able to keep a couple of steps ahead of Germany. Anyway, um, he was quite ill by this time. He died in 1921, and he took the practice of signing himself C, as in for coming, writing in green ink. Apparently, naval captains always write in green ink. And so subsequent heads of MI5, still are known as C, um, but that now means chief, not coming. And uh, the James Bond novels, um, uh, and of course, uh, they were written, by, written by Ian Flame, Fleming, who was a Royal Naval Officer, and who was MI, MI5, the chief is known as M. I'm not sure what M is supposed to stand for. I suppose it would be Mansfield, as in Mansfield coming, an allusion to him. So uh, he'd taken over from uh, Vernon Kell, who'd founded it just uh, two years before uh, Mansfield coming took over. So a, a scintillating figure and a vital figure who's um, all but uh, lost to remembrance these days, uh, who did so much to help achieve Allied victory in the First World War. Um, but right after that, obviously, a conflict erupted in Ireland, and he was sending some um, agents to Ireland. Obviously, we're part of the United Kingdom at the time, but most of the agents were here in London, which was, you know, the capital was crucial, and trying to penetrate the IRA. And these are more, more former um, army officers. Now, Michael Collins was uh, head of the IRA's intelligence, and he unmasked quite a few of these crown agents. Um, or officers, I should say. Agents are really inside the organization. You want someone in the IRA who's feeding you information if you're MI5. Why would someone in the IRA do that? He might have joined specifically to help you, always be on the side of the crown. He might be doing it for vengeance, for money, out of ideological conviction. Um, he might have been blackmailed. You found that he's having an affair, that he's secretly homosexual, that he is. Um, uh, stolen money from somebody, that he's molested a child, whatever, recruitable vulnerabilities. So everybody has their abilities and their price. But anyway, uh, November 1920, uh, uh, a lot of them had been identified by the IRA, and IRA ordered the squad to eliminate these guys, the Cairo gang as they're called, these MI5 officers, some of who'd served in Egypt. That's why they're called the Cairo gang. There's another theory, it's because they um, frequented a cafe in Dublin called Cairo, and about 14 of them were killed in one day, so-called Bloody Sunday, in uh, I think it's November 1920. And um, there were various other people who were shot who just happened to, to get into the way. And so it seemed that they were, they were mostly English, that, um, that 14 English civilians had been shot dead. And they, they, were, they were civilians to all the world. They were in Mufti. Most of them had left the army or the navy. They had to have various reasons to be in Dublin. Um, and so uh, the, there was the RIC um, auxiliaries. These were ex-soldiers of the Great War from England, Scotland and Wales. And they were incensed. They went to Croke Park. Croke Park is obviously the Gaelic Athletic Association's uh, stadium in Dublin for playing Gaelic games like hurling, Gaelic football. And there's a big match on between Tipperary and Dublin, if I got that right. And uh, the GAA was somewhat associated with the IRA. It had been run by the Irish Republican Brotherhood since 1887. The GAA says that on their own website. Um, and uh, some GAA clubs joined uh, the Irish Volunteers en masse. Now, most people were going to just to watch the match. It might be nationalist, that's absolutely fine. It might be vaguely Republican or totally Republican. But anyway, they said, oh, we've got to search for arms because Collins had actually specifically had it that day because he knew because of this big uh, match, there'd be thousands of people in the streets and his assassins could just blend into the crowd. As Mao Zedong said, that they're the people of the sea in which we swim. Um, so anyway, then the, uh, the RIC, they opened fire on the crowd and killed 14 people that got that right. They claimed they were fired on from the crowd. I don't know if that's true. I don't think there's ever been a proper inquiry to it. Some people think that was false, that claim. They certainly recovered firearms. Some people say there's only one firearm, some people say up to 60. They shouldn't open fire on the crowd. I mean, you're being fired at, you want to be quite specific who you're firing back at. That's rather wild and reckless firing to, to hit that many people. Anyway, that's Mansfield coming, but um, he'd lost a lot of precious agents in Dublin. Said, we're not going to be using these against the IRA. We have, we have bigger fish to fry. There are the Bolsheviks, you know, the Soviet Union, the Russian Civil War was still going on. They were preaching Red Revolution, said we're going to 
foment revolution in all uh, foreign countries because we're going to liberate the proletariat from capitalist exploitation. There were, there were other issues. Um, so uh, he largely withdrew MI5 from Ireland, which obviously made life a lot easier for the IRA because the IRA obviously had only killed a bit of MI5's network. All right, that's enough about Mansfield coming.